breath after that. Yeah. This is the third time that I have seen the film and it still gets me every single time. Thank you all again for being here. I am just so honored that we at Journey Out have had the privilege of screening this film and also incredibly honored to be sharing this space with these tremendous leaders and advocates for women and for survivors of trauma. So I am going to start by telling you a little bit about them. To my immediate right is Kia Duque. Kia is the program director at Restoration Diversion Services Incorporated in Compton, California. With almost 10 years of lived experience, Kia has become a dedicated advocate for other victims and survivors of human trafficking. She has lived experience with victims and survivors of human trafficking, foster care, youth and adult homelessness, domestic violence, commercial sexual exploitation of children, LGBTQIA+, and the juvenile and adult justice system. She sits on a number of boards, committees, and task forces, and has done various consultations on subjects including best care practices, law enforcement, and language. Currently studying electrical engineering, Kia hopes to teach other victims and survivors to work on motorcycles. Kia's main goal is to see every victim and survivor have stable housing and access to skill development resources. Her dream, yeah, we can clap for that. <laughs> her dream is to finish her electrical engineering degree. She ultimately wants to open a motorcycle company and vocational school that will teach the most vulnerable populations how to work on motorcycles and become technicians while offering housing during the education process. Her biggest achievement so far is getting accepted into a university to study engineering and becoming a program director. In addition to being a program director, as if all of this was not enough, Kia sits on the lived experience board for Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and National Center for Youth Law Advisory. Kia hopes to bridge gaps and motivate with integrity and kindness. I feel like I get chills just reading her bio, so. <laughs> and next to Kia is Juliette Landau, an actress, director, producer, and writer. As an actress, her highlights include Drusilla on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and spin-off Angel and co-starring in Tim Burton's Ed Wood as Loretta King. Last season, she recurred as Rita Tedesco on Amazon's Bosch. This season, she's recurring as Cordelia on TNT's Claws. Juliet just helmed her visionary feature directorial debut, A Place Among the Dead which she produced with her husband, Deverell Weeks, under their Miss Juliet banner. Their cast includes Gary Oldman, Ron Perlman, Robert Patrick, Lance Henriksen, and Anne Rice, appearing for the only time ever in a scripted movie. A Place Among the Dead has won 20 top awards, sweeping the 11 festivals it's played. Woo! Yeah, we can clap for that too. <laughs> Seven Best Feature of the Festival, Five Best Actress, Four Best Director, One Best Script, One Best Editing, Two Audience Choice. Among the 11 festivals, lady filmmakers at the Fine Arts Theater in Beverly Hills with over 300 films in competition, Shockfest with over 600 films in competition chosen out of 10,000 submissions. Other nominees and honorees include Rob Zombie, Clive Barker, Danny Trejo, 
Zed Fest selected as the opening night festival and Coven Film Festival selected as the spotlight film, cutting edge female centric festival highlighting women, diversity and non-binary storytellers. Especially of, of all times, I mean, it, it's extraordinary to be on moderating this panel, but especially on women during Women's History Month, as we as we close it out, I just feel incredibly honored to share this space with them, and also just discuss what we've just seen. It's a lot. It's heavy, and it's powerful, and it's important to have a space to process that. So I'm going to kick it off with a few questions, and if anyone has questions after that, we'd love to take those as well. I'm going to start with a question for Kia. I'd like to know, watching this film, what comes up for you? And what are your thoughts on its representation of a survivor's journey? Can y'all hear me? Okay, hey y'all, I don't really talk on microphones like this. So, closer, okay. So yeah, y'all gonna bear, y'all gotta bear with me up in here, okay? Um, so yeah, um, initially, oh, I'm gonna keep it 100 with y'all up in here. Uh, initially when I, when I seen the videos, uh, my first reaction was, don't cry, don't cry up in here. Um, even as a survivor, it's still hard to hear other people's stories. Um, a part of me being a program director is I have to take myself out of my own personal story every single day. Um, and that's really hard to do as a survivor because a lot of the times you just, you get connected to people. Um, even if you're not a survivor, you just, you see people going through something and you just, you empathize with them. You want to see them do better or be successful in whatever that looks like for them. Um, and so the first thing first initial reaction was don't cry like you know don't get into your feelings behind this but then my second reaction was you can't avoid getting into your feelings about this and just feel it and it's okay to feel it um, and so they they did a really good job at articulating the different layers of human trafficking um, human trafficking is not a one size fit all type of situation um, it doesn't just because somebody comes from poverty, I think with this whole Jeffrey Epstein case and all that good stuff, we know that it doesn't discriminate against poverty lines. It doesn't discriminate um, based on gender, race, ethnicity. None of that. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that a predator does. And like one of the girls was saying, is they have like this weird thing about them where they can point out the vulnerabilities in a person. Um, whether that be the abuse that happened to them as a child, whether that be they know that they don't have strong relationships with the male involved with them or things like that. Um, they just find whatever is wrong with the person and hone into it. So the ladies did a really good job at articulating themselves um, on the different layers and different aspects. And then also explaining how their journey on getting out um, because a lot of people don't focus on that um, and that's really important because we are not our trauma. We are not human trafficking. We are not, I, I hate the word prostitute, it grinds my gears, but I'm not a prostitute. Um, I was a child. I was somebody's daughter. I was somebody who was trafficked. I was a victim of somebody of abusers multiple times and because I didn't have the resources to get out or I didn't have the skills because I was 15 when it happened. So I didn't have life skills, didn't have money, didn't have ID, social, birth certificate, nothing to do anything or try to get a job. So when you when you think about all those barriers for somebody getting out and you take them outside of um, being a prostitute, you get to see them as more than what they are, more than what their trauma is. So yeah. Is that good? That was amazing. And Juliet, as a survivor of narcissistic abuse and, and a women's advocate, what were some takeaways for you watching this film? Um, is that on now? Yeah. Um, I mean, the film is just so powerful, and I was crying over there, and it's the second time I've seen it, and uh, it's, it's so uh, inspiring as well. 
I think, uh, you know, I made a few notes uh, so that I could be articulate, but I think w the thing that felt so important to me is that it's really about the repercussions and that getting out is just the first step and how, um, you know, reclaiming and even finding one's authentic self and self-value and um, uh, self-purpose and all of all of that is such such a journey um, and when you have been uh, exposed and abused and groomed um, you don't know have any of those tools so I think that that the, the fact that the movie really shows that you know uh, the first step is getting out and then really learning how to live uh, as your best self um, and and uh, not the stuff that was ingrained, uh, I think that was a really powerful message. So true, and a big disservice I think that we often see in depictions of this issue is this idea that someone is rescued and now their life is roses and not thinking about what the consequences are in the aftermath. And that's why we were so excited about this film really taking you through that journey of, of how much there is and that surviving is incredible and monumental and in so many ways the first step to your point. Given that this is one film that, that exposes that myth that we've often seen, Kia, I'm curious what what aspects are there of being in the life or come out in the, coming out of the life that you feel like are missed, overlooked, or misrepresented in society, in education and awareness about this issue? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, but to be real, um, um, y'all gotta bear with me now. Um, <laughs> So aspects, aspects of getting out the life that people overlook. Oh man, um, to be real, um, I think that people only wanna see the rescue side of things. Um, I think everybody searches for glory a lot of the times. Like you wanna be somebody's savior. Oh, we came and we rescued that person off the streets. And where is that person tomorrow? Where is their housing at? If they in the shelter tonight, three months down the line when they get 90 days, sometimes 30, when they get kicked out of this shelter because time is up, where they gonna go, you know? Um, I remember me and my client was having a conversation about plastic bags. And I told her, I said, you know, don't feel bad about protecting what's yours. And I said, I didn't care if I had a plastic bag because at one point in time, all I had to my name was a plastic bag and what was inside that plastic bag, which wasn't much. Um, and so somebody poked a hole in that plastic bag and I got really upset about it. I was like, that's my bag. Like, why are you destroying the only thing that I have? And when we had this conversation, we got a laugh out of this situation because one week we got way more than just a plastic bag now, y'all. We got dishwashers and all type of good stuff. <laughs> so we just so definitely be happy for us. But when we looked back over how that was, it was like, we protecting all that we have. And so when I see law enforcement go outside and they cleaning up these home, well, they say they're cleaning up these homeless accountments, but we really just displacing them and moving them to another place. You get what I'm saying? You're taking everything that they own. You're taking somebody's house. You're taking somebody's clothing. You're taking somebody's food. You get what I'm saying? And you're not giving them the resources to get nothing else. You're just taking it away from them and saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, what bootstraps? And if I don't have the skills within myself, because most most of the victims I was, were all, on here and also myself got in the game young with no life skills as children. Yeah. You don't learn a lot of your life skills till after the age of 18, 21 years old. I know a lot of 21 year olds till this day, not adults, not grown, don't know how to navigate, don't know how to pay bills, budget, do anything. So when you get into the game that young, you get stuck at that age of trauma. So then you get out the, you when you're getting out at 20, 24, I got out when I was 24, but some people get out 30, 
50, 70 years old in their life and they missed all of that time getting learning and growing and getting the skills that they need to be successful thriving adults um and so when i see that the system is me missing things ultimately the first things first is we're gonna always miss statistics and reporting things are never going to get reported if if it's not a safe place so first things first we need to make every place a safe place for victims of human trafficking to come and stand up and say what they need to say or report who they need to report and then two we need to make sure that they got somewhere to live because if you don't have a stable place over your head and stable food in your mouth and good food i'm not but no two food stamps ridiculous 197 a month nobody can live off that that's a ridiculous amount of money to purchase healthy food um so giving livable wages and giving housing and stability and stability looks different for a lot of people so understanding that that aspect of that trauma and really just you know doing what we got to do as a community to come together and rally behind us and this is low-key like this is a step right here so i ain't mad at it And given some of the populations that you mentioned, for example, unhoused populations, I know you also work with the LGBTQ plus community, you work with male survivors. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in that space and, and needs that you see that are unmet there? Yeah. So yeah, everybody think that human trafficking only happens to women um, and women of color, like to be transparent. And that's not true. Um, our agency is one of the very few agencies that accept everybody, all victims of human trafficking. We do not discriminate. Um, the transgender community right now is under attack. Um, and human trafficking is happening like in that community, right in our, our backyard. So when we think Figueroa is popping, Western is popping too. And Western is known for the LGBTQIA community and they are not being taken care of because all you see is the police down on fig. Nobody's doing outreach on, on those spots. Um, and so they definitely need more attention. That's one thing. Um, and when it comes down to the LGBTQIA community, I always say respect people's pronouns. Um, that's a huge thing that people are, because we're so indoctrinated and the way our normal way of thinking, um, we automatically think her, she, male, and things like that. And it's not our intentions to disrespect nobody or disrespect them pronouns because we don't know no better. It's a lack of a lack of education. But I think it has to be a lot more mindfulness when it comes down to that. Um, because the LGBTQIA community has been ignored for so long. And so they need that extra love, that extra attention, that extra care, um, especially when it comes down to human trafficking. And then for men, a lot of men, actually their traumas don't come up until later on in life, um, way later on in life. A lot of the male survivors that I work with don't even know that they were trafficked until we start bringing up the domestic violence situation of things. Um, and so when we start to really break down like childhood and why did you get into a relationship with this person versus this person, then we start to unpack how did they get there in the first place. Um, and male survivors are trafficked a lot more than we know. And that doesn't mean that they are gay. That doesn't mean that they identify as that they're straight men that are being trafficked and women are being the abusers. Um, and so just to, just to put in like, transparent, I guess transparency for you guys, like human trafficking just doesn't discriminate. Like there are, there, you could, you guys could look up online. There, there was, was a Republican congressman who I believe is actually still sitting in Congress right now and has been charged with over 11 counts of human trafficking with testimonies. These are people who make decisions for our lives. And, and yet this person who also has men that they traffic, LGBTQIA that they traffic, women that they traffic, that person gets to make decisions for all of us. You get what I'm saying? So we, we gotta stand up and we gotta take care of the communities that, like I said, the most vulnerable populations, cause they're not getting no clout right now. They're not getting the attention. That Me Too movement was about women and we needed it. 
<laughs> we definitely needed it, but we can't ignore that the men are being affected as well. Um, and the LGBTQIA community is being affected. Kia dropping all kinds of truth on us here with, with your perspective on that. Thank you. And that coupled with everything that comes up in this film, it can be hard to, and I don't think we're supposed to just sit on this information. And I'm sure all of you are feeling this sense of, well, what can I actually do? And, you know, I'm, I'm not a case manager here doing this work and I don't have lived experience. I, I don't work for a nonprofit. I don't have a way to advocate for change. And Julia, you have done so much as an advocate for women. And I have to say, Juliet actually was scheduled to be in rehearsal for something she is working on and moved it around to be here this evening. Completely changed her schedule for this, really prioritizes advocating for social justice issues and, and she's not really supposed to be around people and so you know we're trying to social distance and, and keep her safe. So um, so I, I just would love to hear your thoughts on how you have used your advocacy to create art and inform art. Oh. Well, I think much like like this film, it, it's important to shed light on on darkness and to uh, uh, with the film that I made, we've uh, I, we really my husband and I made it really to provoke a, a dialogue, exactly like what we're having now here, and I think um, that that the community that gets built up around people. Uh, feeling unafraid to share their stories and then see, see identify. And, and if, it's, if it's not something that you've personally experienced, we all know someone who has experienced it. And um, not just, you know, society as a way of, of re-gaslighting and re-traumatizing people that come forward. And it's, it's building the community to say, we don't want that. We actually need to talk about things as they happen and the reality of them. And, and then bringing things into the light is what's healthy. And you can see in this film that all of these women are healing in very, very different ways. Um, and all of them are incredible and valid. Um, uh, and, and part of that healing is that they're actually coming forward and talking about what happened to them. And I think that's critical. It is so important to have survivor voices. And if you'll notice in the film, there were no so-called experts that were featured as part of this. The expertise, everything that you learned came from the survivors themselves. And I think that's an important lesson for us to take away and remember is the fact that those who have that lived experience, that they, they really are champions in their own right to be valued and and seen as the experts that they are and, and, and really to appreciate their contributions in that way, whether it be in shaping policy, whether it be in, in outreach and, and any sort of contributions. I also just wanted to mention that at Journey Out, we provide direct services to adult survivors of sex trafficking and we have a number of different opportunities to get involved. We have a number of volunteers here who helped with sitting at the door, who are taking photographs, who've helped to video. If you were volunteering at this event or in any way of Journey Out Volunteer, we'd love for you to, to stand and just recognize you for your work. Lori, I see you sitting. <laughs> Okay, some of them are shy, but, uh, but they are here. And I, I just want to emphasize that advocacy and, and using your voice can look so many different ways. I, for example, I also want to mention that Sabrina Lewis, Miss California, USA, has, has joined us to, to be here this evening. And again, using her platform to contribute and to raise awareness and take time out of her schedule and how even in just sharing about this film, telling other people about it and sharing volunteer opportunities that we have. We have on our page at Journey Out LA, if you're on social media, we constantly post for different needs that we have and, and would love to get you involved. So I had to, had to mention that. Um, and 
lastly, before we before we take any you know one or two uh, questions from the audience, if you have any, both of you are powerful women, thrivers. Yes, we should clap for that. Overcomers of trauma. Are there any words of wisdom or inspiration that you can offer to that help to get you where you are today? I love what uh, the woman, uh, one of the women in the film said to the community when she said, um, you know, your family may not be the healthy family, but you create your own family. And what you guys are doing in the organizations that, that you work in, you create a community and a family um, in the true sense of the world, word. And I think that that, that you know, I, we once had a friend who said, uh, blood isn't always uh, thicker than water. Sometimes it's just stickier. <laughs> so. Man. <laughs> I'm really trying to think of something good to say, y'all, but I don't really got too much. I guess the only thing that I would say, like words of wisdom when dealing with a human trafficking victim is just get involved. I mean, there there's so many things like, like uh, you know, Mary was saying, there's so many things that you guys can do. I mean, you all might work nine to five jobs, have children, busy lives, you know, you can't you can't go and volunteer or do outreach or do things like that, but you know, you can post on Facebook, you can bring awareness, um, you can hashtag some stuff, you can hashtag journey out, hashtag RDS. And then if you do have time, you can pull up to any one of our drop-in centers and see how we get down and see how we work. Um, I'm gonna tell y'all in advance, approach our office with caution. Because I'm a little ghetto, so we have a, a real interesting time at our office. <laughs> but it's it's like a lot of people think when you're around a human trafficking victim, it's an unsafe situation. An abuser is going to come and kick down the door or shoot up the place. And never once has that happened in our office. And we're located on Long Beach Boulevard, which is a major blade in L.A. Um, so we have victims of human trafficking walking down the street all day, every day in front of our office. And never once has anybody shot in our office, fought in our office, or done anything that was dangerous, paraphernalia, brought drugs, weapon, or anything. And no, we don't have security. And no, we don't have nothing that can protect us. And so by the grace of God, you feel me? We we got into the movement and we've been able to thrive. Like, like you said, thrive in there. So if you want to get involved, get involved. Don't make an excuse, don't, don't hold out. People like me need y'all. Because if it wasn't people who, who did things like this, like show up and donate and, you know, even donate clothes, shoes, like, I'm telling you, my whole wardrobe is remade professional clothes with donations, like, things like that matter. Hair extensions, like, I'm a black girl. I like to rock some weave up in my hair. <laughs> yeah. like, Things like that matter. If somebody donated a whole bunch of makeup brushes, you get what I'm saying? Yoga mats, like things that we don't think that are would necessarily matter to people, like self-care journals, um, self-help books. Like our clients want to know what to do. They want to get to the other side, but sometimes they don't even know the question to ask to even get, you know, the answer to that. So, you know, just whatever you got, whatever you can, whatever, even a prayer, like, even if you go home and you just pray for, for me, you get what I'm saying? That I can continue to touch all the people that we touch. Or pray for Mary, or pray for the young lady next to me, you know what I mean? Just that we can continue the work that we're doing, that's more than enough. You get what I'm saying? So anything that you can, anything that you have to offer, you don't have to do much, but it helps, you know what I mean? So, I guess that's my that's my words. I wasn't supposed to say nothing, but God touched my heart. <laughs> When are you running for office, please? <laughs> please. <laughs> well, I would love to take a couple of audience questions if uh, if, we, if we have any. We have one right here. Sophia, first of all, so impressed with everything you're doing, and it's just so amazing. And thank you for that list because it's good to know. It's good information to have. So I'm going to go run to the house and see if we can get it together. But um, I'm just curious from your intro, 
why specifically motorcycles? Like, where did that come from? And how does that incorporate? And just elaborate, please, because I'm. I can't go home not knowing. <laughs> yes, yes. Good question. There was a lot of praise uh, for for our lovely speakers and, and for Kia. A question about why motorcycles in her intro. So um, all of us have dreams. All of us. We got childhood dreams. Like y'all got childhood dreams up in here, right? So when I was in the eighth grade, I knew that I was gonna build solar powered motorcycles. Like that was something that was in my head. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know. And then my trauma happened. Then I got trapped. And it kind of put a damper into that. But when I got out and when I got out the life, I didn't do therapy like most people wanted to do therapy. I was like, I want to go back to school. And so I wanted my therapist to teach me how to get enrolled in the school. And part of that was exploring how do I get to engineering school. Um, and so I'm a Harley girl. And right, that part right there. Um, so yeah, I'm a Harley girl because my grandfather was the closest thing to a father figure I had in my life. And he was a part of this motorcycle gang called the Gremlins out of San Francisco. Cause I'm also a Bay baby too. And so um, when I got out the life, my therapist helped me like, come up with my school schedule, everything like that. And then I came back around to it. Like, well, you got your general ed, you got all the things that you need. Like now it's time to look into a four year university. What do you want to do? And I was debating between, do I want to give up on my dream of working in motorcycles and really drown myself in this case management stuff and really be nonprofit? Or can I figure out a way to bridge the gap and do both? And my heart has always been to create solar power motorcycles and run Harley Davidson out of business. So <laughs> I know I'm gonna do it. Just keep, just keep an eye out for the motorcycles because I know I can do it. And one thing that, that's why I believe that there's a God in this world because from the eighth grade till now, nobody has created a solar power motorcycle yet. And that's how I know that that's for me. You get what I'm saying? I know that it's meant for me to own an American made motorcycle and be this human trafficking survivor and really hone in and say, hey, women can be technicians. Women can own motorcycles and ride just as hard as them buff dudes with them burly ass jackets on them. <laughs> we can do it and we can be just as badass and confident and just strong, you know what I mean? And we can do, we can combine it with this nonprofit stuff. And that's why it's important that if I do the motorcycles, it has to come with a school and that school has to come with housing too. Because I'm not gonna do it halfway. I gotta do it all the way in. So yeah, that's that's my dream. That's my heart. Question over here. I don't like microphones either. Um, my name is Helen. I was eight years in the life, 28 years out. So I just wanted to show a face that. Can we come on? And my question is the game has not changed. Okay? I mean, I'm 28 years out and eight years in, that means it's more than 30 years ago. The, the tracks haven't changed. The laws haven't changed. The policing hasn't changed. We have gotten better, you know, as far as, you know, Journey Out's been around for a long time with Mary Magdalene Project before. Um, we need to find a way, and this is kind of a question also for, you know, others, how to stop them from playing on those vulnerabilities. You know, like what, what would you tell a parent to teach their child so that if they if they were faced with this kind of uh, trick, you know, coercion, uh, kidnapping, you know, what what would you tell a parent on how to educate their child so they don't fall into that? Wow! Thank you so much, Heather. Um, Helen, I'm so sorry. Helen, thank you. Uh, Helen's 
survivor and uh, just asked what advice for parents uh, there is if you thought that your child is being trafficked as the tracks and things have not changed uh, in, in years. First of all, let me say, sis, I'm with you. Thank you for being strong enough to share your story because that's not easy. And being able to stand up in a crowd full of people that you do not know and tell them that you a survivor and you standing on that, I love it. Unapologetically. And then, what would I tell a parent? I always get that question. And some of the parents that I work with, I have to be honest with them and tell them like, your baby is not your baby no more. Um, once you go through a trauma like that, the child that left that house is not the child that's gonna come back. You are gonna get a, a rebel, well, they're gonna come, their emotions are gonna come off as rebellious and anger and things like that, but that is them processing their trauma. That is a difficult thing to go through, um, and it's hard to understand. And so for a parent, I would say, don't try to understand it, but try to help heal it. Um, because sometimes we not gonna understand everything in life, but do that mean that we turn a blind eye to it? Do it mean that we ignore it? Absolutely not. We just do what we can, you know what I mean? I say, love on your kids. We live in a generation now where, and y'all gotta forgive me if I get a little emotional, but we live in a, a generation now where I've never heard kids aspire to be strippers. Um, and when I hear an eight year old or a six year old say that that's, they wanna be the next Cardi B, like that's not okay to me, you get what I'm saying? And so our kids look at the same social media we look at. They listen to the same music we look at. And if not, they better at maneuvering and looking at more than what we looking at. Um, Snapchat is a huge thing. 24 hours is deleted. You don't know what our kids are getting sent. Instagram, you can actually delete your messages now off Instagram. So we don't know who's contacting them, none of that. So be aware, know your child, be your child's best friend before them people at school can be their best friends because you don't know what they're looking at on their friends' phones when they go into the school and things like that. So you need to know your child inside and out. And if your child does happen, God forbid, to be trafficked, connect them with the nearest agency to you. Um, you cannot do it on your own. You cannot support that type of trauma on your own. You need to be supported by not only getting therapists for yourself, um, because parents go through secondhand trauma. That's real. Um, so getting therapists for your therapy for yourself, but also making sure that the kid has therapist therapy and things like that. And then like, I, I always double down on lifelong support because um, trauma comes out in weird ways. So if a kid experiences something at 11, they might suppress it until they're in their 20s. And then you don't know why they're using meth or you don't know why they're snorting cocaine. Yeah. Well, it's because something probably happened, you know what I mean? And so, like I said, building that relationship, being your kid's best friend, building that trust where they can be a safe, as a safe place for you. I grew up in a black household and you couldn't talk back. You can like, you gonna get your butt whooped, like all those things, but we need to kind of, I'm not gonna say let your, cat, your kid run all over you now, but we kind of need to step back a little bit and listen to these children and what they got going on in their lives because um, COVID behind to, uh, behind the screens have really put a toll on their mental health. And so I get more now, younger, the young, the more we get out of this COVID situation, the younger the people I get that are getting trafficked. I actually got contacted by a school right off of Figueroa um, because they're having trouble with their kids getting picked up and getting trafficked from that school. So if you a parent, um, and you're sitting in this room, first of all, become aware, as aware as you can. There's no young, there's no age that is too young to start telling your kids about predators. Predators are real um, and they don't discriminate. So it's no age that's too young, but also making sure that you take care of yourself too as a parent, you know, because that's tough, that's secondhand trauma, you know? And I always empathize with my mom, even till this day, my mom is still healing from the trauma that I went through. 
um, and she didn't acknowledge it till later on in her life. And so it is important for me to support her um, because she did what she had to do to try to support me during that time. So it's now, now it's time for me to step up to the plate um, and be that support for her. And so understanding that even if you do go through that trauma, that secondhand trauma, it's okay and it's normal. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid of that. You know? Parents is cool. I just want to add that at Journey Out, we also provide prevention programming, which I lead, and, and something that I always try to encourage parents, particularly if they're afraid to broach this topic and they don't know if their child has, has been exposed or not, is to just really emphasize to them the importance of building that trust and that open space for kids to share, because particularly when, when children do grow up extremely sheltered, nothing feels worse than you're p telling your parents that you talked to someone you weren't supposed to online or that you shared a photo or received a photo that you weren't, that you, that you shouldn't have, that went against their wishes. And so that can often set them on a track that then spirals where they are willing to do anything to keep a secret from their parents finding out, including trust a trafficker who says, well, in order for me to not tell your parents, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. And so it's important even in setting those boundaries with them that they know at the end of the day, if something is serious, that they really should come to you and that they can come to you and not feel like their entire world is going to end and unravel if they do. I think we have time for one last question that I saw right here. Actually, excuse me. Actually, it's not a question. I would like to commend the panel. And it's ironic that you say you're on Long Beach. Yeah, we're on Long we Beach. We just got the information. I just told her I'm going to come by, check check the organization out. Yes. Um, Me too. We both were. Just so happened, my field correlates with yours because I'm a DV case manager. Mm -hmm. So I do, we do understand. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking for tools and resources to give to our clients because some of our clients are affected by sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. I am yes. really happy you brought up the LGBTQIA plus <laughs> community. <laughs> because I'm also an advocate on that for the DV, DVC Council. And some of the things you brought up tonight, I can take back to them to put on calendars so they will start looking and trying to find resources for them to help that organization out that supports them. But you guys did great. I just wanna interject one thing too. You guys did awesome. But um, also too, when you talked about secondhand trauma, but secondhand trauma affects the whole family. Mm -hmm. So if there's brothers and sisters, they need the mental health services, the, the therapy as well, because they saw their son, their sister or brother go through that. And they need that desperately because they could follow that same path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Important takeaways, thank you so much. And I love that we're brokering connections here between case managers working in the domestic violence space with sex trafficking, and that is so important, and, and it's a living example of what we all can hopefully take from this experience is that wherever you are, you have a sphere of influence. These ladies on this panel with me are doing incredible work in their spheres, Every single one of you has your own network, has your own space where people trust you. They will attend something, they will listen, they will share something, they will be advocates because of your example, because they care about you and what you have to say. So don't undermine your ability to use your voice and lift it up as a as a proponent of social justice because each and every one of you by being here shows that you have a commitment you have a passion and a heart for caring about the underserved and that is not an accident so I just really want to commend each and every one of you for being here for using your time your space and your energy and thank you so much for joining us this evening
and um, I, I I think we have wow one what one, <laughs> one last last thought. <laughs> To your question, Helen, what can parents do? I just want to point out that California law requires <clears throat> that public schools teach a sex trafficking prevention course mm -hmm. for all students in grades 7 through 12. So, <clears throat> I know because I researched it and I wrote an article with my wife about it, and doing a very informal survey, what I found out is talking to administrators that many of them don't know about that requirement. So I don't know if that's being disseminated the way that the California legislator intended it to, but that's one thing that you can do. Talk to your school officials and, and, and ask, do you have this, this in the curriculum? Because it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Wow. Thank you all so much again. I, I know that the producers aren't available to, to be with us this evening, but I do definitely want to thank Sadali Shri, Alyssa Milano, Jeannie Mai for their incredible work in this film and, and bringing it to life. And again, a huge thank you to our incredible panelists for their hearts, their perspective, and their inspiration. Thank you. And that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>